We're doing a mock draft of the top 10 picks. And to help us do so, let's welcome in some guests. 24 7 Sports College football analyst, former NFL prospect, and front office member, Smoke Dixon, and CBS Sports NFL draft analyst, Chris Trapasso. They will be doing the drafting. I'll be playing the role of Roger Goodell, uh, but please do not boo me. So let's get it rolling with the number one pick, guys. That belongs to Chris and the Chicago Bears by way of the Carolina Panthers. Chris, what's the pick? So for as much fun as it would be to throw kind of a curveball to start, the Chicago Bears with the number one overall pick are picking Caleb Williams, quarterback, USC. And for me, it's not a slam dunk that he's the number one overall prospect. I think he and Drake May are pretty close. But the pinpoint accuracy from inside the pocket, yes, I will say the Patrick Mahomes type improvisation ability, uh, everything that he can do outside of structure and within the structure of the play. I don't know if it's a no-brainer, um, but I think this is the Bears, a team that certainly needs the quarterback position to be addressed, goes with the best player in this class at the game's most valuable position with Caleb Williams at number one. Chris, I couldn't, I couldn't go with you more than that. I think he is the best <laughs> player in the draft. Um, but something's not feeling quite right with this pick because there's no reason for this guy wanting to be in Chicago. And he's showing the Chicago Bears that he doesn't want to be there. For one, not even going out there on a visit, slap in the face. And then when you look at it, I got three reasons why. I think the Williams family is trying to work their way out of it, a la Eli Manning his way out. And then when you have an organization, three things got to tie in. Ownership, general manager, which is front office, and head coach. Well, the head coach might be out. General manager is kind of shaky from his decision-making. Ownership is wavering a little bit as well, too. Historically, Chicago is not a city where you want to go and throw the ball in January and December because it's tough. It's right there on the lake. Other than Cleveland, Chicago is probably the hardest place to throw. Third, that fan base is really tough. And the fact that they feel real comfortable with Justin Fields being there now, he's traded. Caleb's now going to be like public enemy number one, and he should be the guy QB one. So I can see them working their route. And again, the Williams family is using silence, it's power, mm. and not being so loud so everybody knows what the player is. But I, I can feel a little rumbling of that. I think that's really interesting because I think at this point, I mean, I, I kind of fell victim to it that we've all kind of written this pick in pen or in Sharpie that this is going to be a no-brainer. The draft doesn't start until at least pick two. But I think a lot of the points that Smoke brought up make sense. Um, I like the signing of Keenan Allen, but how much long-term viability does Keenan Allen have? Um, probably not a lot. And, and I think beyond that, there will be a lot of pressure. And I think if you're the Bears, you see the commanders at number two, and, and we'll get to Smoke's pick in a second at number two. If you could move back one pick and you still like Jaden Daniels quite a bit, and you could get maybe Washington's next year first and a second round selection and still land maybe Jaden Daniels or Drake May, I think you have to consider that. So it's good that Smoke is bringing that up because I think that is somewhat of a possibility with the first pick. You're right, Smoke. It, it seemed like there was, um, to, to use a pun, a lot of smoke around the potential for uh, for Caleb Williams to pull an Eli Manning, as you said. That's a discussion that we'll have a little bit later on in the show with a different instance. Um, but since then, it's it's been kind of quiet. And so I think that uh, you're, you're keeping a close eye on if that could potentially pop up as we get a little bit closer to draft time. Let's go to the second pick. Smoke, this is your pick on behalf of the Washington Commanders. Who you got? Well, Commissioner Proud, I'm... I'm Proud to say the Washington Commanders will be taking Jaden Daniels, quarterback LSU. This guy right here fits all of the three phases the quarterback needs to fit right now in the NFL. Can work on script, make time and accuracy passes with touch, work off script when the pocket breaks down with pocket toughness, and then that when the game needs someone to make that spectacular explosive run, you can get creative with him too, and he can go ahead and score a la Lamar Jackson. Not quite Michael Vick, but he has that in him. And for me, I, I'm really interested to see if Jaden Daniels or how he works with Cliff Kingsbury, who just got done as the offensive coordinator for Caleb Williams in USC. It's going to be kind of an air raid system. They're going to want to throw the football all over the lot. They bring in a very respected and well-liked head coach in Dan Quinn. Added a lot of pieces in free agency as well. I don't want to put the cart before the horse and say be CJ Stroud 2.0, but last year we were looking at the Texans team 
It's a team nowhere close to the playoffs. If you get the right quarterback, pair him with some decent veterans and, and maybe hit on a few other picks throughout the draft, you can go from number two overall pick to the playoffs. And I think Jaden Daniels has that ability. I'm only a little bit concerned about his propensity to take some big hits when he does leave the pocket. He's certainly fast. He's going to run away from NFL defenders, but it's sometimes his spatial awareness. I think he just has to be a little bit better not taking those big shots at 6'3 and 210 pounds. All right, so two quarterbacks are off the board as much as we're trying to galaxy brain this to see if there <laughs> could be potential movement and shockers on draft day. I do think those uh, pretty much a foregone conclusion as of where we are right now. So let's go ahead and just move on to the third pick. And Chris, this is yours. You were drafting for the New England Patriots. And what's the pick? It's going to be Drake May quarterback from North Carolina. He is my number two quarterback in this class. And this is not what I would do. I, I think the Patriots, Gerard Mayo, Elliot Wolf, there, kind of the de facto GM in New England. They realize that they're not ready to compete in what has become such a loaded AFC, but you need your quarterback. And this is the class to do it. You're picking third overall. It's not a spot where this organization has been really ever in the last 20 years. This is the quarterback to pick. He checks a lot of the prototypical boxes that Jane Daniels and maybe Caleb Williams don't, that he's six foot four, over 220 pounds, but can do a lot of the same things that Jaden Daniels and Caleb Williams do. Winning off script, like Smoke said, is so important. Um, you can even use him in the designed run game a bit. Maybe not quite as accurate as the other two quarterbacks, but I think this would be a great selection for New England, a guy that has maybe a little bit of development, but I think this Patriots team is – a year or two away from really competing in the AFC. Perfect spot for a quarterback with his skill set. The only questions I have is there's some courage throws that I want, I would like for him to make and stay stronger in the pocket. And he has some questions that he has to answer about some inaccurate dirt balls that he throws. But the Patriots need a quarterback. And if they're close with the other three that's available, I think that's a solid pick. Chris, I've got to ask you, um, released your updated big board yesterday and something that you mentioned really stood out. You did say that you have Drake May as your number two quarterback, but that it was actually really close when you were looking at Drake May and Caleb Williams saying that uh, your evaluation, it's, it's not that close when it comes to the grades that you give them. So how close is it between your number one quarterback and Caleb Williams and number two in Drake May, even though he is being drafted third? Sure. It, it, it's really close in my estimation. And, and maybe Smoke has a different opinion. I, I think the big time throws that we saw from Drake May were more frequent than Caleb Williams. Um, yes, there are some inaccurate throws. We saw it at his pro day earlier today that he'll miss one five feet over an out route's head um, at times, but then he'll follow that up with like three of the best throws that you see on a drive that will lead a touchdown. And I like that he stayed at North Carolina didn't transfer, didn't take NIL money for a bigger school, lost Josh Downs last season to the draft, a really productive NFL caliber wide receiver, and still was really good. He fits the mold of the quarterback that in crunch time, I'm going to count on Drake May to elude a defender and make that drop a dime throw deep down the field. All that upside when it comes to yeah. Drake May. He was absolutely exciting to watch in, uh, in college football this past season. Let's go to the fourth overall pick. Smoke, you are drafting on behalf of the Arizona Cardinals. What are you doing with the fourth overall pick? Well, Commissioner Proud, my phone just started blowing up. I just took a look at it, and someone's calling me for a trade. This is when the draft really starts. Yes. The Minnesota Vikings is called up, and I've made the trade with the Minnesota Vikings. And the Minnesota Vikings are taking J.J. McCarthy, quarterback Michigan I mean they need one with this offense that they, that, that they have Sam Darnold is there perceivably as the starting quarterback now he's a young, he's an older guy that can be the mentor to JJ JJ doesn't have to come in no pressure nothing on him he has to come in learn the system understand how to play quarterback and in a year or two be the guy in Minnesota and how about this landing spot for any of the quarterbacks? Like the Vikings start this mock draft at 11, and that's what they have in the real draft, 11 and 23, after making that trade to get that extra pick. I think the Vikings have the best scenario for any quarterback in this entire first round. So you're J.J. McCarthy, and like Smoke said, you're maybe not thrust onto the field in week one, in week one because of the presence of Sam Darnold. But once you do take the reins, and usually rookie quarterbacks aren't sitting too long anymore – you're throwing to Justin Jefferson and Jordan Addison and TJ Hawkinson. The offensive line has been solidified lately. 
there is some thought that maybe JJ McCarthy isn't ready to be like that focal point because he wasn't at Michigan, but man, it would be such a luxurious situation for him to fall into with Kevin O'Connell and Josh McCown and all those weapons in Minnesota. Usually when you're drafted uh, pretty high, especially as a quarterback, you're not entering into a good situation, uh, but as you laid out, it, it seems like a pretty good situation in Minnesota. If, uh, they end up trading for that pick and for J.J. McCarthy. Chris, I I'm curious from an NFL standpoint, though, if we have quarterbacks go one, two, three, and four, what's the trickle-down effect? Are there any teams, quarterback needy teams, that are potentially panicking at that point? Yeah, Smoke and I talked about this earlier. I think the Denver Broncos would be kind of in a situation where are they just going to stay put at 12? And their GM, George Payton, that kind of was the GM that orchestrated that disastrous Russell Wilson trade, Although he's only entering year two with Sean Payton, it's year three for him. And I think if the Broncos don't make a considerable stride forward, George Payton, who was in Minnesota before this, um, might be looking for a job next year. So I think they're another team, just like the Giants, just like the Raiders, that are really desperate for a quarterback. And if they see the Vikings that have more ammo uh, trade up in front of them and suddenly they're waiting on Bo Nix or Michael Penix, they're kind of in a panic mode. And while Beyond that, I think there are teams that would love the wide receivers to fall, the offensive tackles. There would be a big ripple effect if this is how it goes with quarterbacks with the first four picks. I think there's a good possibility that it happens. Yeah, as you said, the Vikings have a lot of ammo in that first round with uh, two first-round picks in the top 24 of the draft. We'll see if they use it to get great players or if they use it to uh, trade up and get – their quarterback of the future. Uh, let's move on to the number five pick, the Los Angeles Chargers. A lot of question marks on what uh, Harbaugh will do in his uh, first season back in the NFL. But Chris, you are drafting on behalf of them. Who are you picking? The Chargers are picking Tal Fuanga, offensive tackle from Oregon State. And Jim Harbaugh loves offensive linemen like Smoke loves Alabama prospects. Like name an <laughs> Alabama guy, Smoke's going to love them. Show Jim Harbaugh a mauling right tackle who's athletic and big with length, everything that you would want out of that kind of traditional, stronger right tackle side, the strong side of a lot of the formations there. And he's going to pick him. He talked about it at the owners meetings. And I don't think that was gamesmanship. I think he was really saying, look, you need to build your team around the offensive line. They have a GM who was with the Baltimore Ravens under Eric DaCosta. Um, I think this is kind of a slam dunk pick. They have Rashawn Slater at left tackle, who's good when very good when healthy, but the right side has kind of been an abomination in front of Justin Herbert, and they can pick a wide receiver later in this class. Phenomenal pick. We all know how Harbaugh wants to play football. He wants to play dirty, muddy, but he also has to understand that he got a quarterback out that he's also going to protect by running the football, play action passes. He doesn't have to get hit that often. So great pick. Love what he brings to it. This is a hardball type of guy. Outstanding. You did some scouting on that one, man. That's all. <laughs> as it as it uh, pertains to your scouting, though, Chris, I got to ask real quick with the uh, offensive tackle position, Olufushano I've seen go above him. I've also seen Joe Alt in the mix. So what is it about Fuanga that has him as the first tackle off the board for you? Yeah, I actually have Olufushanu myself as the offensive tackle one in this class. I didn't see him regress a lot, but in talking to people around the league, and I'm sure Smoke has as well, there is some thought that he might not have the nastiness that you want out of that you know first offensive tackle off the board, and 2023 wasn't quite as good as 2022 when he really broke out at Penn State. With Fuanga, you do get that nastiness. You get the mean streak, and you think, okay, he's just a great run blocker. But I thought in pass protection, protecting DJ, DJ Ui Ungalale last season, Fuanga showed his mobility at like 6'5", 335, that made it look like he was a top 10 pick. He kind of just fits what teams in general want in the top 10, picking an offensive tackle. And like Smoke said, seems like a classic Jim Harbaugh type of <laughs> player and just a Jim Harbaugh type of philosophy in the draft. Absolutely. Let's move on to the sixth pick. Smoke, that is you with the New York Giants. Who are you picking? New York football Giants. They they hunkered down with Mr. Uh, the quarterback last year, the guy that they're giving $40 million to. So now they got to get him some help. And we know we have Marvin Harrison sitting right there on the board, Junior. But also you have the neighbors. And working with Joe Shane and, uh, and Brian Dayball, they like going with guys that check the boxes. Yesterday, neighbors came out, ran a 4-3-5, 42-inch vertical. Everything says take this guy. So they're going to run up there, turn the pick in because he's a height, weight, and speed guy that can play football as well, too, in New York. 
and give that quarterback something to throw the ball to. And they're going with Monique Labors, LSU. So I don't have much faith in Daniel Jones, but like you're saying, they're tied to him because of that contract. Malik Neighbors is my number one wide receiver in this class. I am the world's biggest yards after the catch proponent. You watch the Super Bowl, you watch the Chiefs and the 49ers. They can create yards after the catch better than any two organizations in football. They've been really successful. The, to me, the biggest difference between Neighbors and Harrison Jr., and certainly there's some areas in which Harrison's better, I think Neighbors is more electric after the catch. Bouncing off tacklers, accelerating. I, I think Marvin Harrison Jr. is really fast too, and he's a little bigger. But that is what the Giants need and what Smoke said. When you have Daniel Jones there, you don't have a lot behind him. You can't get the quarterback. You can't move up. Malik Neighbors can change kind of the course of the career for Daniel Jones because he's that explosive with the ball in his hands. Okay, so Malik Neighbors is the first wide receiver off the board in this 24-7 Sports Live mock draft. But Chris, you are drafting for another team who could potentially be in the market for a wide receiver, and that is the Titans at number seven. Where are you going here? All right, this might seem like it's galaxy brain, like you mentioned earlier, Emily. <laughs> but the Tennessee Titans, they need offensive tackle. It is an absolutely stacked offensive tackle group. I think it's as good as the wide receiver class. Their GM, Rand Carthon, would be sitting here saying, well, Marvin Harrison Jr. still on the board at seven? It would be like a run the pick to the podium type or call it in instantly. They're going Marvin Harrison Jr., wide receiver, Ohio State. They bring in Calvin Ridley. They have DeAndre Hopkins. But then you give Will Levis, Marvin Harrison Jr. to kind of be that long-term number one. For as much as they would love offensive tackle, I think Harrison Jr. is just too good to pass up on here. This Marvin Harrison Jr. was number one on a lot of people's board, but I think they have to fix that offensive line. And there's a guy in Notre Dame sitting right there and say, "Why not me? Why do you have to go to uh, a receiver to score points when you've won in Tennessee by running the ball, being tough up front, knocking guys off the ball, and that's how you win with Rand Carthon's philosophy. That's an old running back, one of my good friends in the scouting game. I know that he wants to." win the line of scrimmage but like you said marvin harrison is sitting there pretty and you have to give someone will levis to throw the ball to nuke is getting up in age calvin is that number one type guy but when you bring in a young guy like that it, it can help but it, it'll be tough not to go with an offensive lineman but like i said one of the best receivers that i've scouted and he was number one on my board even though he didn't run didn't jump do anything you cut the film on he's that guy well, this is a perfect segue from what Emily asked me earlier about Olu Fushanu and other tackles in this class. If this is how the board plays out and Marvin Harrison Jr. is there at seven, I think this is where we could see the Tennessee Titans getting a bunch of phone calls for maybe the Saints, the Jets, potentially any other. And there's always a mystery team or two later in the first round that would be like, we want Marvin Harrison Jr. Titans knowing, hey, Joe Alt is still there. Fashanu is still there. J.C. Latham from Alabama is still there. Amarius Mims, who's a big mauler, very athletic and explosive, huge guy um, at le uh, right or left tackle from Georgia. This could be where we see one of those somewhat rare, but they do happen, trade up for a non-quarterback because I don't think anyone had Marvin Harrison sitting on the board at number seven overall. It's the old philosophy of do you draft for need first or just the best player available? So I have to imagine that Carthon will uh, be salivating a little bit if all of a sudden Marvin Harrison Jr. is there at seven. And it is a need for the Titans. Um, you, know, you could argue that offensive tackle is a greater need. But again, it's uh, one of those question marks that uh, people get paid millions of dollars to make. And we will just have fun and play mock draft here on this show. <laughs> but let's move on to the uh, number eight pick. It's the Atlanta Falcons. Smoke, you are drafting on behalf of them. Who's your pick? Well, the Dirty Birds. Um, I just got blamed <laughs> for being a Bama guy. So I'm going to go ahead and do the favor for everybody right now. John Abraham was the last pass rusher that the Atlanta Falcons had to get the guy on the ground. We saw a quarterback go one through four. Got to get somebody to get to the quarterback. So the best pass rusher in this draft, Dallas, Big Sack, Turner, University of Alabama, Atlanta, Dirty Bird. You don't got to go anywhere but 20 east and find your home, Dallas Turner. Yeah, I would love this pick for the Falcons. It's an obvious need. Uh, I love how he tested at the combine. And for me, with Dallas Turner, and Smoke can maybe speak to this more than I could, but early in his career, he was the number one edge recruit in the country when coming out in 2021. 
Uh, and I didn't see it. I didn't see him have the Will Anderson type of instant impact, but that's asking a lot in the SEC, even at Alabama as a freshman. I liked that in the final season, the pass rush moves were better. The speed to power was better. And you know that he is just a freak level athlete. We saw that in Indianapolis. This would be kind of one of the best pairings for a team need and a prospect value in the entire first round. Chris, you've poured over the tape. Is Dallas Turner worthy of the first defensive player taken in this draft? Yeah, I have him graded inside my top 10 for all those reasons. That I, 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 In my summer scouting, I didn't see it, but he really, like the lights came on in that final season at Alabama. Maybe he just needed to not be with Will Anderson, just kind of be that focal point of the defense. He really brings it all as a pass rusher. I think he's a better version of Nolan Smith, who went late in the first round despite the pectoral injury last year from Georgia to the Eagles. Um, smaller, but just so much explosion and bend around the corner. All right. The Bears back on the podium for the ninth overall pick. Chris, who are they selecting? To pair with Caleb Williams, they're going to go wide receiver Roma Dunze from Washington. And to, to kind of piece this together, what the Bears would have, they would have their underneath separator possession guy in Keenan Allen. They're rugged, kind of Debo Samuel-esque, yards after the catch guy in DJ Moore. And then they're just rebounder down the football field. Roma Dunze doesn't have that Xavier Worthy speed, but he plays like a great vertical threat because of how good he is catching the football above his head, that he's always open two feet above his head. Um, they could go in a lot of different directions. They could go offensive tackle. If Dallas Turner was there, I think they would look at edge to pair with Montez Sweat, who they traded for last year, was really good. But this would just be, hey, we drafted Caleb Williams, and let's just disregard, even though I do think there's credence to it, that he leaves and, and you know Smoke's idea that he kind of works his way out of Chicago. But if he's there, I think it's all about building as many weapons around Caleb Williams in Chicago. Well, if you're going to go with Caleb as the number one pick overall, you got to make this whole party look great and get him a, get him some toys. Uh, like you mm -hmm. said, you have DJ, you got Keenan Allen, now you got Rome trying to find a way to score some points and just win the draft day party, which you, you will do if you make this pick. But again, I think that offensive line and the way that you protect and the way that you play in that division, especially when it gets cold, and I know you got two indoor stadium teams, but at some point, that offensive line should be addressed. And there are a lot of receivers in this draft that can do a lot of the things that I'm not comfortable with Roman Duze not being able to do in terms of elite ability to separate. A lot of his throws are contested jump ball catches. And then in the NFL, you can win, but we only saw two receivers in their lifetime, Larry Fitzgerald and New Hopkins, win that way. At some point, you have to be able to put your foot in the ground, separate <laughs> on intermediate routes and on um, – now throws. So you're saying smoke, it feels a little bit like a fantasy draft <laughs> than uh, it, 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 addressing the team needs. <laughs> it, no, it feels like if you're drafting a quarterback first overall, and then you believe that he is that guy, and I believe that he is, and the best available player can help him become the best version of himself in Chicago, which again, it's a tough place to play in December and January in terms of throwing the football because they're right on that lake. Give it to Caleb so he stays in town, mm -hmm. and and I'm and I'm okay with that pick. But I, I, I later on in that later on like nine ten when I can move back and get other receivers that I deem as close too good as Rome is, I would listen to a lot of trade calls and see if somebody wants to come up and get in front of the next team that needs a quarterback. All right, let's finish out the top ten with the New York Jets. Smoke, who are they picking at number ten? Well, they just hired a new general manager. His name is Aaron Rodgers. They just got an <laughs> offensive coordinator. His name is Aaron Rodgers. And Aaron Rodgers is making this pick. Aaron Rodgers typically never gets a first-round um, offensive player that he can throw the ball to. And he loves tight ends. So I'm going to give him Brock Bowers, University of Georgia, the best tight end in this class. Now, everyone wants to line him up and just be a single Y, and that means an attached player to the line of scrimmage and have him block and be that slug, but he's not. He's a dynamic playmaker with the ball in his hands, can create yards after contact, and also score at any point. And when we see it right now in the NFL, that tight end position has become a sexy position that it's everybody wants one. You got a Travis Kelsey, you had a Gronkowski before, you had a Jordan Reed before. You just have guys like that that you have to get the ball to, work in the middle of the field, Aaron's getting old, 
You need somebody to get the ball to. And I'll throw out one other name. He kind of reminds me of George Kittle, not quite the blocker mm -hmm. of Kittle's caliber, but there's some knocks that I've heard about and, and read about during this pre-draft process that Bowers isn't really that big. It's like 6'3", 245, kind of the stock height and weight for uh, tight ends today. George Kittle is not Rob Gronkowski size. He's not even Travis Kelsey size. But I think the yards after the catch ability, the separation skill that Brock Bowers showed, even as like a freshman in the SEC was so impressive. And what's fascinating about him, he's kind of flown under the radar during this pre-draft process after being like the penciled in top 10 tight end during the season. He gets injured here and there at, at Georgia, doesn't work out at the combine. I think this is a great pick for a Jets team that is about as all in as you can be with Aaron Rodgers and Mike Williams and all those players on the defensive side. And Brock Powers feels like he can be that Sam Laporta guy to come right in and be productive in year one. He is an absolute weapon. So that would be a very interesting combination in New York. There you have it. The top 10 mock draft. You see it here. We got to run on quarterbacks to start in the first round of the first four picks. And of course, all the positions that we talk about super deep in this draft. You're seeing those wide receivers go early. Chris, before we let you go, just real quick, I feel like you do this exercise by yourself a lot for CBSSports.com. Now that you're doing it with somebody else, what surprised you about this mock? Well, I think it's what I talked about earlier that Marvin Harrison Jr. was still on the board. Smoke loves him. I like him a lot. I just have him slightly graded behind Malik Neighbors. And forever, up until really that LSU Pro Day, when Neighbors ran fast and jumped high like we expected him to, it was like, oh, it's going to be Marvin Harrison Jr. at four to the Cardinals. They're not going to move out, or a team might even trade up for him. To have him at seven, um, again, maybe it's not actually the Titans. Maybe another team moves up. That surprised me as we went through this exercise, but it would have to really reshuffle and have a big ripple effect on the rest of the first round um, if he's still there after the Giants pick at number six. Will certainly be interesting, and we know that you will do a few thousand more of these uh, before draft time. You got four weeks, Chris. Thank you so much for coming on. Uh, you can check out his coverage on CBSSports.com, and for more NFL draft talk from our friends at CBS Sports, uh, be sure to listen to the With the First Pick podcast. They are breaking down the NFL draft throughout the off season, uh, but now is definitely the time to listen.